In the murky waters of Boston Harbor, a haunting tale unfolds, entering on the life of Grace Asquith with a shadowy figure. Amidst several limbs, a story of love, betrayal, and a quest for truth emerges. So listen to the end of this story to see how this twisted tale unfolds. Now let's get into it. Now during their lunch break at noon on October 5th, 1936, Louis Romani, Anthony Barbari, and William Tortorci paused from their laborious morning tasks at the East Boston Airport, settling down to enjoy their meal. Mid-bite to his sandwich, Louis Romani glanced up and spotted a burlap sack drifting in the shallow waters of Boston Harbor nearby. Curiosity picked. He set aside his lunch and beckoned the others to join him in investigating the peculiar find. Drawing closer, Romani reached out and seized the core securing the package. With a tug, the waterlogged bundle unfurled, revealing a chilling sight. The severed right leg of a woman cascaded into the shallows, leaving Romani stunned. The trio recoiled in horror, confronted by the gruesome discovery. After composing themselves, they promptly informed the supervisor, who then alerted the authorities. As a crowd gathered around the grisly remains, the police swiftly arrived, taking possession of the leg and bag before transporting them to station number one. Subsequently, they were transferred to the medical examiner's office for further analysis. Now, the medical examiner, William J. Bickley, he inspected the contents of the burlap bag. He discovered that the leg had been wrapped in a newspaper dated July 12, 1936, almost three months prior. Removing the newspaper, Brickley proceeded to examine the leg, identifying it as the right leg of a woman, severed just below the top of the thigh. The leg had been bent at the knee, with the ankle bound to the upper thigh using a combination of drapery cord and part of a shoelace. Turning his attention to the bag, Brickley noted its origin as a burlap sack stamped with the label Selected Maine Potatoes Arustic Grown Potatoes Liberty Natural Brand, 200 pounds. He also observed that the cord used to bind the bundle together resembled the same type of drapery cord used to buy the leg. Brickley was later quoted in the newspapers expressing his suspicion. It looks like murder to me. The imputation of that leg was much too crude to have been done by a surgeon. I am more inclined to think that this was the work of some person more accustomed to cutting meat. As details about the victim emerged, it became apparent that she likely had a petite stature and dark hair, indicated by strands matching the color of the leg found earlier, suggesting she was a brunette. Further examination revealed her shoe size to be a mere three, indicating her small frame. The condition of her feet and legs hinted at a past involving dance or extensive walking, which estimated to be between 25 and 40 years old. The medical examiner concluded that the leg had been submerged for no more than three weeks. Later that same afternoon, Patrick Kane, a East Boston boilermaker, spotted a drifting burlap bag in the waters roughly half a mile below the airport. Venturing into the water, he retrieved the bag and discovered two objects crudely wrapped in what seemed to be a green curtain and newspaper. Upon wrapping them, Kane was startled to find a woman's severed naked left leg and a bloody lower torso. Authorities were promptly notified and the contents were swiftly transported to the medical examiner's office for further examination. The newspapers reported that as soon as the second bag arrived at the medical examiner's office, Dr. Brickley took it and spread its contents on the table. He examined every little bit, and he noticed the dates in the newspaper were the same as the bag found earlier, and that the burlap bag was stamped with the same, main potatoes, stamped as the previous bag. Dr. Brickley looked more closely at the bag and at the leg and foot. Then he exclaimed to the assistants as he noticed a little callus on the heel of the small size three foot. There was a tiny callus spot on the left foot which may be of value in the identification. 
He put the leg down and looked up and said, I've ordered a plastic plaster model made of the leg and foot that I am holding down at the morgue. It may come in handy in the case of fitting a slipper proving the identity of this dead Cinderella. Now more police search crews were sent out to the Boston Harbor to drag the bottom and search for more bundles. The victim's upper torso and her head were still missing and if found, the victim might be more readily identified. The newspapers blared headlines such as Gross lights discovered at airport, woman's body's parts found, and harbor holds legs and organs as police launch night hunt. Now following the news, an influx of calls bombarded the police department from individuals reporting missing relatives. Astonishingly, at that moment, there were over 200 women reported missing slowly in New England. For several days, police checked into each of the reporting missing women. All of them were easily eliminated because none were a size 3 shoe. So the mystery continues. The mystery was front page news every night. Everything found in the harbor included a pair of pants, a handkerchief, a smock, and a jacket was all seen as potential clues to the identity. But speculation was all that the papers could offer until Miss Isabel Murphy walked into the office of the Boston Police Superintendent Edward Fallon. Miss Murphy, who was from Austin, told Fallon that her friends Miss Grace Asquith of Weymouth had been missing since September, and she feared that her friend was the murdered women, woman. She related that Asquith, who had been widowed several years before, has just dropped from sight in September. Murphy had attempted to call her several times and was unable to get an answer. She also told Fallon that about a week before her disappearance, a man they both knew had threatened her friend's life. And afterward, Asquith went to her attorney about this threat. She told Fallon the name of the man but did not know what precipitated the threat, only that the attorney had urged her to take action, which Asquith refused to do so. Murphy then told the superintendent there was something strange about it, which I didn't understand. Fallon then inquired of Asquith had many male friends, to which Murphy replied, she was very popular, but I don't think she's seen many of them lately. She's engaged to be married to a war veteran by the name of John Lyons, who lives on St. Boltiff Street in Boston. Murphy mentioned that she hadn't managed to reach Lyons either. Fallon speculated that perhaps they had eloped, but Murphy dismissed the idea, stating firmly she wouldn't have taken such a step without consulting me. So she exited his office. Fallon assured Murphy of his immediate investigation into the matter. With seemingly little trust in the Boston Police Department, Murphy wasted no time. Almost immediately after leaving Fallon's office, she sought out a phone booth and dialed Alan C. Wingate, the Weymouth real estate agent involved in Grace Asquith's bungalow purchased near Women's Pond. Sharing her concerns about her friend's disappearance, Murphy requested Wingate's assistance in investigating the bungalow. Now Wingate hung up his phone and was soon in his car and on the way to 19 Alpine Road. He walked a few steps up the front door, knocked and knocked and knocked with no answer. He then proceeded to investigate the rest of the property and noticed a few odd things. First, he noticed that the garage doors were wide open. Second, he noticed that the big ceramic flower urns that had been located at the end of the driveway were now missing. Now seeing some of the neighborhood kids playing in the neighborhood, he walked over and asked them if they had seen Asquith. Nobody had a feeling something was wrong. Wingate drove home, called the Weymouth police, and reported folks are wondering about Miss Asquith down on the Alpine Road. She hasn't been seen around her bungalow for more than a week and doesn't even answer her phone. One of her Boston's friends, Miss Murphy, just called me up. She's afraid Miss Asquith is away or may be ill. Now, Weymouth Police Lieutenant John Hutchins, the officer who took the call quickly dispatched a patrol car to the bungalow 
to investigate. Soon, the patrol officers reported back to Hutchins. They had found the front door locked, the garage wide open, and the back doors open. They did not go in, but looked in the windows and told Hutchins that the place was deserted. The Weymouth police began to think there might be a connection between the body parts found in Boston Harbor and the missing Asquith, so they contacted the Boston police about the matter. Weymouth Police Chief Edward Butler was notified and decided to investigate on his own. With several officers in tow, he traveled down to the Asquith bungalow. The chief and his men arrived, went around the back of the cottage, and entered through the open back door. The back door opened right into the kitchen area. The chief was struck by what he found. On the stove, he found kettles and lifted the lids to find half-cooked, moldy food inside. At this, he turned and exclaimed to his men, Something queer has been going on in here, all right? People don't go off and leave a half-cooked dinner unless something is wrong. They moved into the little area off the kitchen and found three empty wine glasses with just the dregs left. A closed door blocked their entrance to the rest of the cottage. Chief Butler opened it and walked gingerly into the living room. And upon first glance, everything appeared to be in order. And they moved into the next room, which was Asquith's bedroom. The chief opened the closet and there on the floor was a tiny slipper, size three. Butler took the slipper and handed it to his officer in order to rush this slipper to medical examiner's Berkeley's office at once. See if it fits the plastic model of the dead woman's foot and let me know immediately. The officer hurried out with the slipper in hand. While Butler searched through Asquith's bedroom, one of, one of his officers ventured into the bathroom and silently emitted a scream, beckoned the chief to investigate. Rushing to the scene, Butler found his officers staring at the shock at the bathroom. Now a scene of horror with blood splattered across the floor and within the tub. Immediately, discernible over what appeared to be a man's footprint and blood on the floor and a partial handprint on Mr. Gore on the tub side. As police searched the Asquith bungalow, miles away at the medical examiner's office, Dr. Brinkley was examining the slipper brought to him by the Weymouth police. He eased the slipper onto the plaster cast of the foot found in Boston Harbor and excitedly exclaimed, It's a perfect fit. Oh, this slipper belongs to the missing Miss Asquith. There is no question but that we have discovered the identity of the dismembered victim. He went further to state, not only is it a perfect fit, but look at this heel. He took off the slipper and pointed to the slight indentation in the sole and said, that proves it. It completely fits the callus on the heel of the dead woman. Now police continued their search of the widow's cottage. They also began to dig into Asquith's checkered background. It seems the Weymouth police knew her well and referred to her as the Merry Widow. She was known to police for several reasons. On a few occasions, police had been called to her house to break up loud parties. It seems that Asquith would have parties night after night in the summertime. It was known that her friends would come to her little bungalow in cabs from Boston and that many of them were men. Police also knew of her because approximately a year before the murder, she was arrested on a drug charge. When neighbors were interviewed, they related how Asquith liked the gay life and that she would have frequent parties at her bungalow. Her best friend, Miss Murphy, and her husband were frequent visitors to the bungalow, they said. Furthermore, she was most commonly seen in the company of two men, her fiancé John Lyons, the disabled war vet from Boston, and Oscar Bartoloni, who was from Quincy and was said to be her handyman and sometime chauffeur. Bartoloni was a rather imposing Italian with a mustache and a jagged scar across his face. Neighbors also told police that she hadn't seen the widow since September 20th when she was seen in the company of Lyons and Bartoloni at her bungalow. Now, Chief Butler put a call in to the Superintendent Fallon of the Boston Police informing him of the developments and the likelihood that Miss Grace Asquith was the victim they were looking for. Superintendent Fallon, along with Boston Police Commissioner Eugene Sweeney and Deputy Superintendent James Claflin, came to the bungalow. 
With them was the woman who had first reported Asquith missing, Miss Isabel Murphy. Murphy was asked to identify Asquith's slipper to confirm that it was in fact hers, which she did. Then she was asked to step outside while Butler debriefed the Boston cohort. As Butler laid out what he had found in the bungalow and what he had learned from the neighbors, the name Butleroni came up. At this, Superintendent Fallon exclaimed, that's the name of the man Miss Murphy claims threatened Miss Asquin's life. Fallon answered by saying, I sent word to Quincy to the Quincy police to pick up Oscar Batteroni. They found him late this afternoon, and they are holding him down at police headquarters until we can calm down. However, I can't say as much for Lyons. I can't get a line on him. Now Fallon responded, nobody seems to, and told Butler that he had sent a detective to Lyons apartment on St. Boltive Street and was told by the landlady that he hadn't been seen since the 19th of September when he was picked up by a man named Bart. The detective gained entry into the apartment and found all of Lyons' clothes and possessions undistributed in an odd, unopened $50 veteran's disability check in his mailbox. The police quickly surmised that this Bart was Oscar Bartoloni and hastened to Quincy to interview him. At the Quincy police headquarters sat the scar-faced, hulking Italian Oscar Bartoloni. The contingent from the Asquith bungalow arrived at about midnight and began to question him. He still not fluent in English. He required an interpreter at times to speak. Bartoloni was asked if he had ever thrown Miss Asquith. Bartoloni admittedly denied that he had, saying, I never do such a thing. I like her. She was my friend. Why would I want to hurt her? The police questioned Bartoloni all night, and his story emerged. He recalled that on September 19th, Asquin had asked him to drive out to Boston to pick up her boyfriend, Lyons, and bring him back to the bungalow. Bartoloni said that he had done this many times as he had acted as a sort of chauffeur for Asquith and her boyfriend in addition to being her handyman. He continued by saying he brought Lyons to the Asquith bungalow and that Miss Asquith invited him to have a glass of wine with her and Lyons, which he did. Bartoloni then stated that after they shared a glass of wine together, he left, and that was the last he had seen both of them. When asked about the half-cooked meal on the stove, he explained that Asquith had ordered the food from the Waving Beef Company a few hours before and that it had been brought to the bungalow by a delivery boy. His story squared away with the empty wine glasses and the half-cooked meal. Police pressed him further but couldn't get anything more from him, so they decided to hold him as a material witness. A search warrant was obtained for Bartoloni's Washington Street apartment, which is a was above a curtain shop. What police found in his rooms were proved to be very damning. The stuff behind Bertoloni's bed was a partial set of green currants matching the ones used to wrap the legs and lower torso. Investigators found a large butcher's knife with what appeared to be human blood on it, rolled up within the currants. And downstairs in the current shop, police also found other sets of matching green currants. Lying in plain sight on the floor were potato bags seemed to the ones similar to the ones the body parts were found in and in the storage area of the apartment bloody car seat covers were found now knowing that asquith had gone to her attorney about the threats patroloni was making the police interviewed her lawyer george locus about the incident it was then the police learned of another crime patroloni had committed against asquith locus told police that asquith had confided in him and told him that on the night of august 17th while Lyons was away, Bartoloni had gained entry to Asquith's bungalow, woke her while she was sleeping, and then violently assaulted her. Afterwards, he threatened to kill her if she told anyone. Locus urged her to go to the authorities, but she decided not to act due to the embarrassment and would bring in the threats from Bartoloni. Locus also told police that Asquith feared Bartoloni to the point of fleeing her bungalow to the safety of her friend, Miss Murphy's home. And when questioned about his whereabouts in the days after the murder, Bartoloni mentioned that he had become ill on Monday, September 19th and went to his doctor. Samuel Lerner in Quincy, detectives 
went to his doctor's office to check on his story, which the doctor confirmed. However, the doctor also added a surprising detail to his confirmation. He told investigators that Bartoloni had the unmistakable smell of death about him, a smell the doctor was very familiar with from his days of handling bodies as a medical student. The doctor added that he asked Bartoloni about his stench, and he, he had explained it away by telling the doctor he was a part-time chef and got the smell from handling food. Detectives also began to look into the background of Oscar Bartoloni and found out about an interesting incident that happened a year earlier in which Bartoloni came to blows with a man over the affections of another woman. It even made the newspapers and they termed it a love duel. On June 29, 1935, Bertoloni was involved in a fight in which his nose was nearly severed for the knife of one Luigi Messini. The, the wound left a deep scar across Bertoloni's face. It appears that he and Bertoloni were fighting over Miss Gini Lalaberti, Messini's paramour. Messini claimed he was attacked by Bartoloni and that he had defended himself with a knife. Eventually, the incident was ruled as self-defense and no charges were brought against Messini. Detectives must have seen this as a more evidence of a pattern of violent behavior on Bartoloni's part. Now, while the detectives were digging into Bartoloni's past, other detectives were digging into Asquim's yard and tearing apart the bungalow for further evidence. The head and upper torso of Asquith still had not been found, nor had the remains of her lover, John Lyons. The police began a thorough search of the house for any evidence of the remains of the two. As hundreds of onlookers watched, the front and the backyard were dug up and women's pond was dragged, but searchers found nothing. Inside the bungalow, police had better luck. Upon closer investigation, there were small blood stains in the living room near the fireplace and the bedroom. Police deduced that Miss Asquith had been attacked in the living room and then brought it to the bedroom. When the police began to dismantle the bathroom, they found to their horror chunks of flesh clogging the drain in the bathroom and in the pipes of the cesspool. The floor with the bloody footprint and the tub with the bloody handprint were removed as evidence. Police widened the search to likely places that a body would be dumped. Boston Harbor was dragged and two bodies were found. Neither of the bodies were connected to the case. Police were never able to identify either of the bodies. The Quincy Granite Quarries, a favorite place of criminals to dump bodies, was searched and another body was found but it turned out to be another unidentifiable John Doe. The police boat watchman was patrolling Boston Harbor on the morning of October 23, 1936, when it almost hit like a floating barrel. When the boat reared away to avoid the barrel, one of the crew members noticed something floating just beneath the barrel. A grappling hook was thrown out and the object was pulled in. It was a small package wrapped in what appeared to be a bloody green curtain. The package was opened and it was found to contain the bloated decay head of Miss Grace Asquith. The head was brought to the medical examiners. Briefly, he determined that the curtain that the head was wrapped in was identical to the currents that the other body parts had been wrapped in. He also made the determination that the woman had been struck several times over the head with a blunt instrument, making small fractures besides the major fracture extending from the right temple to the top of the head. He further stated that in his report, that the head was severed from the body by a person with superhuman strength with a heavy keen edged knife, probably the same one which was used to dismember the corpse. On October 30th, 1936, Petrolini was indicted by a grand jury for the murder of Grace Asquith. No indictment came down on the murder of John Lyons due to the lack of a body. However, officials involved believe he had probably been killed as well. The trial began on September 7th, 1937 at the Superior Court in Denham. Sitting on the bench was Judge George Francis Larry. The prosecution was led by D.A. Edmund Dewing. For the defense, Petroloni had George Lorry representing him. The prosecution presented its case first, although the handprint from the tub was never connected to Petroloni. The footprint on Asquith's bathroom floor was the highlight of the case included bringing a footprint expert from Vermont, who testified that in his opinion, the bloody footprint found on the bathroom floor was that of Bartoloni. When the prosecution rested, it was a pretty sure thing that Bartoloni would be convicted due to a mountain of physical evidence as well as the various witnesses against him. In essence, 
his defense was that he was not the murderer, but that the missing boyfriend, John Lyons, was. The argument didn't hold up very well when compared to the evidence against him, and the jury voted a guilty verdict. After the guilty verdict, he was informed that he would be given his sentence to the next day. That night, he was remanded to the Norfolk County Jail in Denham, in just around the corner from the courthouse. As he was coming back from dinner, Petroloni climbed up on the top rail of the third tier of the jail, which is about 55, 50, 50 feet high, and took a swan dive. It was said that he fell. As he fell, he cried out, Here I come, Grace. The fall should have killed him, but it didn't. Bartoloni survived with only a broken arm. The next day, he was sentenced to death in the electric chair and was sent off to Charlestown State Prison. In 1939, owing to the fact that giant lions had never been found, Governor Charles Rudy, just seven hours before Bartoloni was due to be executed, commuted his sentence to life in prison. In 1961, at the end of his term as governor, Francis Forkel pardoned Oscar Bartoloni. Forcolo explained that he had always felt that it was unfair to sentence Bartoloni to life in prison when giant lions had never been found, which in Forcolo's mind left doubt as to Bartoloni's guilt. However, it is important to note the lion's sisters were interviewed years later, and they stated that they had never seen or heard from their brothers since the time of the Asquith murder. As soon as Bartoloni stepped onto free soil, he was arrested by an official of the immigration department and deported back to his native Italy, where he spent the rest of his life in the city of Florence as a free man. Well, that will do it for today's story. If you enjoyed this story and would love to hear more, then please hit the like and subscribe button and even use the comment button to leave any suggestions for any future stories. Thanks for joining me and see you on the next one. Keep it saucy.